Good morning, everyone. It's good to have you with us as we come together to worship the Lord our God. As far as announcements go this week, we only have one to bring to your attention, and that is next Sunday, Jerry and Edna will be out of town. They're going traveling, so uh, be praying for them as they travel, and also Mr. Boozer will be here preaching for us. Be praying for him as God lays a message on his heart for us. And I think that's all the announcements I have, but I do have some prayer requests. Remember Miss Peggy Johnson? That's uh, Jerry and Edna's neighbor, Hunter. I mean, some of you remember Hunter when he's come a couple of times. And uh, I think Jerry calls him his adopted son. So, <laughs> But Hunter's mother has been diagnosed with a congestive heart failure. So be remembering her, praying for her. She's in the hospital right now. Also, remember Andy Haynes, uh, who's uh, someone here in town a lot of folks know. And uh, his dad has passed away. Be praying for his family. I think Pee Wee's one that told us about Andy, wasn't it? So uh, remember him and his family, and the loss of their loved one. Scott and Teresa are traveling back from vacation. Be praying for them. And also George Rochester, who many know in town, has uh, had a stroke and not doing very well. Remember Mr. Rochester as well. I think that's all I have, unless you have other things. We need more comments on these. Well, if not, let's start our service as we look to our God in prayer. Let's pray. Oh, God, our Heavenly Father, again, we do thank you so much that by your hand you have brought us here to your house. We pray, oh, God, now that you would open our hearts to your word, that you would help us as we worship you through song, through your word, and, Father, that our hearts and ears will be open as we hear your word proclaimed. We do thank you so much that you have given us this wonderful tool of prayer that we can come before your throne and pour our hearts out before you. We do thank you that you have taught us how to pray. Be with us now as we pray the prayer together that Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You turn your Bible to so Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. It's Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. And we're going to talk about the greatest speech ever given. Let's hear what the Word of God has to say to us in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, a man am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bardana, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Thanks be reading to God's Word. The greatest speech ever. Now, great moments are born out of great opportunities. Opportunity comes along for us to say a certain cliche or certain part in a speech. And that's what Kurt Russell says in the movie Miracle. He uh, had this 1980 U.S. Olympic team that played this Russian team, and the Russian team has never been beat, ever. So during this moment here, he uh, says a couple cliches in this movie, and it was a great moment that was born out of the great opportunity. It was an opportunity for him to say something right at the very time that was said. And I'll go over some of these things that in a few moments of some other speeches that will remind you of some of those moments. Now, Jesus creates an opportunity for his disciples today in our scripture. He says, ask him, says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who does people say 
that Jesus is? Have you ever asked yourself that question? The people around you, have you listened to people around you to hear what they say about Jesus? When you're not in church and you're out somewhere and you mention Christ's name, what do you hear? Sometimes you hear some different things. Uh, I don't believe in him or I don't believe it that way or somebody strike up a conversation that they don't ever read the Bible but they'll bring up something that they heard or hearsay to contradict what you're saying. So it's a lot of things that we ourselves, if we listen to hear what the people outside of church are saying about who the Son of God is. Now, the disciples say that some of them thought it was John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist was uh, beheaded, and they thought he came back to life. Well, some thought, well, he was Elijah. You know, Elijah was taken up in chariots of fire up in heaven. So they thought he came back because, why? Wow, Jesus was doing all kinds of miracles, wasn't he? He was showing them these miracles was from God, that he was God. He was Christ. He was the Savior coming. But they didn't believe that. They believed anything but that. And, of course, the others thought he was Jeremiah or some of the other prophets. Now, with their thinking of this, that's why they got the perception that he was not the Messiah because they know about the prophets. They've heard about prophets. They've read about prophets. Their forefathers wrote about some of the prophets were their kin people. So they knew what some of the powers that some of the prophets had. And they just thought Jesus, the Messiah, was a prophet. Now, that was the word on the street, of course, the Son of Man, is to be believed that he was these prophets. Now, well, who do you think I am? Jesus asked the disciples that question. Who do you think I am? That's a question I'm going to let you put in your mind today, this morning. Who do you think Jesus is? Ponder on it and really think about it today. What? Who do you think Jesus is? That's the question he asked. And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's who you are. Peter's been walking with Jesus. He'd been watching the ministry in the early ministries of Jesus. He, he's there. So he sees these miracles. Now, when the other people on the street, they only read about the miracles the prophets did. Here, Peter sees the miracles that Jesus is doing. He knows that this is not just a prophet. This is a Messiah, the anointed, and that's what Messiah means. It means that he is the anointed, and only anointed by God, and these few heartfelt words that he said gives Peter a great speech, maybe even the greatest. Lord, you are the Messiah. You're the Messiah of my life. You're, you are God that has come down in human form. That's what Peter is saying. How do we ourselves, when Jesus asked us that question. Who do you think I am? Do we think that God is someone like only answers our prayers? That's, that's it? When we pray to him, he gives us things and blesses us things. Is, is that the extent that we think Jesus is? If it is, we really need to go back and reevaluate. We need to look and see what Jesus is. He's the Messiah the creator, the one that knows our thoughts, the one that directs our lives, that puts people in our lives in different situations, he has a lot of work to do and does a lot of work in our lives that we don't even know about. And we might think, what? Well, for instance, you might be late going somewhere. And you're late getting there and you're saying, oh, God, I got was late getting here. But there was an accident before you left. It could have been you. God could have said, let's delay you a little bit. He puts things in there in our lives every bit of the day. He says, I am working with you. He's not just someone that we pray to or to ask things for. 
It seems like we get caught up in a lot of times of keep asking and asking and asking and asking, what are we giving? What are we giving back to show that Jesus Christ is the Messiah? So what Peter's statement, what makes his statement so powerful is that the timing that he gave this, pronouncing to the community, pronouncing to the other disciples and telling Jesus, you are the Messiah. Now, there's been a list of great speeches through historical, some fiction, and I'm going to give you a couple here. Dwight D. Eisenhower, his farewell address in 1961. Some of us was born then, what we called him, and Lee. He says, we must guard against the acquisition of a warranted influence, he said, by the military-industrial complex. Now, he was the right person issuing this warning because he was a general at one time before he became president. And now that he's president, then he made this statement that he was the president of the United States. And that was a powerful saying during that time and in our history. Fiction, Mel Gibson in the movie Braveheart. He said, they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. And these were spoken at the right moment when the Scottish army was uh, is losing heart of the English forces in there in this battle. Martin Luther King in 1963 saying, I have a dream. This was the right vision for a nation which would judge people by the content of their color instead of their character. He had a dream that we would judge people in this saying by their character, not their color, not the way they look. And we are so easy to jump to make these accusations on people and the way they look, the way they dress, and the color of their skin. We look at this and we judge. Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, he offers the right understanding of America as a nation. He says, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. We all, men and women, were created equal. Now we think, well, we're not created equal because my wife, she wears makeup and stuff like that, and I don't. But in our minds and our hearts, we are created equal. We think alike. Things happen. We have that creation. We don't look at ones created like less than we are. So the greatest of these speeches are given by the right person at the right moment and the right vision, and the right understanding. So the timing is there during these times, and the timing for Peter was there at this time because they were believing that he was just a prophet. God, Jesus wanted to understand, what is the people out here saying about me? And most of all, and most important, he wanted to know what his disciples thought. Stands today, Jesus wants to know your thoughts. What are your thoughts? Who do you say? If someone comes up to you and asks you who Jesus Christ is, how are you going to tell them? What are you going to tell them? All this was true when Peter declared it about Jesus. For starters, Peter is the right person. He's not an extraordinary person. He's one of the characters in the Bible, is he? He's not one of the kings. He's not one of the, the biggest leaders and, and, follow, and people follow Peter. He was a what, fisherman, wasn't he? That's what he was, a merchant. He has the same strengths and weaknesses as the other disciples. There was nothing special about Peter. They all had it equally, just like we have it equally. He will protest when Jesus speaks of his suffering and death. He will say, I will stand with you, Jesus. I will not let them take you. And he will stumble and deny Jesus three times before he was crucified. How could that be? It's like salt water and, and, and regular water, isn't it? He said, I'll stand beside you, Jesus. I'll fight with you. I will even die for you. And then here comes the soldiers. 
He's warming his hands by the fire, and somebody says, aren't you one of those disciples? No, sir, not me. Denied Christ, and, and there he was saying, I will fight for him. He even cut off the ear of a soldier. And what compassion Jesus had to heal that soldier's ear back. I wonder if that soldier was a believer after that. I wonder if he just kind of slid and went out another way, knowing that this man put that ear back on. That's another another story and another sermon in itself. So Jesus, uh, Peter had his thought like, like, like ours. We will praise Jesus in one moment, and we deny him also. And you say, well, I don't say I don't know Jesus. But sometimes what you don't say matters. There's a time when you should have said to that person, stop that cursing in front of me. Stop that bad language, that filth, stop it. I know Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. Stop it. And you think, I'll get clobbered. <laughs> so, we was at the beach, sitting on the front. Kids stopped up out there, and they was using some language. I hollered out, stop that filthy language. I didn't want to hear it. And I'm proclaiming that I know who Jesus Christ is. He is my creator. He is my savior. He is your savior. I guarantee you, if someone come up to you and said something bad about your sibling, about your uh, children, your grandchildren, and just talk bad about them, I bet you would fly up and flog somebody probably pretty close to it and then ask forgiveness afterwards. He would jump all over them. How dare you to talk to me bad about my child, about my brothers, about my sisters, about my family. How dare you to do that? How dare someone talk about your Messiah, the anointed creator that came down for us and died for us so that we will have a relationship with God. We should be able to pounce on someone when they are taking God's name in vain. When we see programs on TV that's not fit to watch, stop watching them. Stop buying the advertisements that they're advertising. Send letters to these advertisers saying, I will not watch this program as long as you have this advertiser doing this. I ask you, what does a Hardy's commercial have to do with two women half naked on a hood of a truck? eating a sandwich. I don't even like the big old hamburger look. This kind of looked greasy to me. And the women surely doesn't look professional. So, shall we continue to buy that product from Hardee's? Or shall we say, okay, we're not going to do it. We're going to send a message to Hardee's. As long as this advertisement's here, we're not going to do this. Yet we have control. But we got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah for us. we got to truly believe that. That the anointed one from heaven, God himself, came down here for our salvation. And we got to stand up. Look at all the churches around us. All the people confessing that Jesus is their Messiah. What happens when two or three people talks about taking prayer out of some area or some, uh, someone prayed or someone had a church in a place they weren't supposed to have it and they stand up against it and they say, oh, okay, we're, going, we're not going to upset you. These few little people, we don't want to upset. Why don't we want to upset them? I want to upset them. I want to make them just fight mad. Maybe they'll get the message that Jesus is my Messiah. Who do you say he is? And that's what we got to look at. We're letting this world, we're letting these people, because we're sitting back and saying, well, we're going to pray about it. If someone comes to your house freezing cold, no shirt on, 
needs a coat, we tell them you're going to pray for them and send them on the way. Same thing. Same thing. We need, as Christians, to start standing up and letting people know that our Messiah, our Creator, the ones that forgave us of our sin, the one that sent His Son to die on the cross for us to be able to get to heaven, to live eternally, peacefully, quietly, in a lovely, beautiful place that human language cannot describe. Our Creator's done that for us. And we cannot stand up for Him here. That's sad. And that's what Peter was directing here and telling the others. And that's why he told Peter, Peter, I am going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Now, he didn't say, Peter, I'm going to give you these keys right here and they fit the pearly gate. You go on up there and unlock it and whoever you let in, you let in. And who you don't, that's up to you. He's saying, Peter, you're going to be the rock, the foundation of the church. You're going to be a leader. You're going to tell people who I am. And what Peter told him, that you were the Messiah, he said, you couldn't have got that from nobody else but only from God. So when you're standing there and you're saying, Christ is my Messiah, he's my God, that was a gift from God. Look how many people cannot say that. You ever had somebody to tell you that, they loved Jesus or they knew God and you know that they never have and how awkward it was for them to say that. Before God came into my life, I was the same way. When someone say, would come up and invite me to church or, or ask me about Jesus or something like that, i say, yes, I know I got my Baptist. I was hoping they wouldn't ask me any questions about the Bible because I didn't tell them nothing. But Jesus ought to be able to flow from our lips when someone asks us to explain ourselves. Why are you so happy? Look what's happened here. Why are you so happy about this? Who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? When Peter makes this statement, he has the right vision, and he sees Jesus as the Messiah. Now, literally, what Messiah does mean anointing. And these questions posed by Jesus and answering these questions, Peter knew, he knew the Son of a living God. Not a dying God, and not a dead God, not a cement one, not one made out of stone, but a living God. In the next chapter, Peter will hear God's voice boom out of this cloud and say, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. As in uh, chapter 17, verse 5. A big boom. Now see, I wish we had that boom. Or maybe we do. But we don't believe enough to hear it. A few chapters back, here's Peter saying, I know that you're the Messiah, the anointed one. Now God confirms it. A big boom out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. I am well pleased. Listen to him. Jesus is telling you the same thing, just like Peter. Listen to him. God is confirming, yes, Jesus is real. He is my only begotten Son. I sin here for you. Listen to Him. The gates of hell will not prevail against Him, in verse 18. The church will be so strong that death itself will not be able to overcome it. Look at the martyrs of the uh, apostles. Where's the church standing now? Look what the church went through in the beginning during this time of where they crucified Jesus. They thought that was going to be it. No other. His father was run. There would be nothing else said about Jesus Christ. But yet, here we are today in this church 
and the church of God is still standing. Hell cannot prevail against this church. Nothing can. The church will be strong. And Jesus concludes by giving Peter, of course, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He's going to be a chief teacher. And that's what Peter has done. He's been our chief teacher. His words in the Word of God, it teaches us where he walked beside him. So what can we do to follow the example of Peter and becoming the right people in the right moment, sharing the right vision and the right understanding? The coach in the movie Miracle he says, the great moments are born from great opportunity. We all have opportunity. Whether we stand in the grocery store or walking past someone, stop at a stoplight, we've all had opportunities. And God has told you, say something. Tell that person they look nice. Tell that person, hello. Say something to that person out of love through Christ. And how many times have we went on thinking in our mind or that person's going to think I am crazy, that I'm stupid or I just don't have the men just mental or something. I, oh, I better not say that to that person and go on. How many times have we thought that? How many opportunities have we had to say something about Christ and didn't do it? It's sad. And I've been in the same boat. I'm not saying this, this for all of you, I'm myself too. We have opportunities. And we give ourselves every excuse in the book not to do it. And you says, well, I really ain't had much opportunity. We can write letters. Now we've got fast emails, we've got websites. We can start doing some things to keep a lot of trash off of our television sets, off of the media, out of the papers. We have power. We have the most power than anyone on this earth, and that's because we have Jesus Christ. He's got your back. You're going to say, well, what, one, one person? But no. If one person starts it, this person does it, this person does it, that person does it. My challenge for you this week is to find that one thing that bugs you. That really is taking the minds of our young people and non-Christians, taking their minds and polluting it with some kind of junk. For instance, just go back to Hardee's. We stop and get a hearty biscuit or whatever like that. I challenge us to write them. What does this commercial about two naked women got to do with selling your burgers? Why can't we do it? And I challenge you to do it. I'm going to do it this week. I want to know. And I want to tell them. If you continue in this path, look how many more restaurants I can go to. It's wide open. They ain't like they got the best food in the world, is it? It's fast food. It's a filling. But I guarantee you, if we start pressuring and start doing things like this, we will start seeing things clean up a little bit better. And you can see that our Messiah, our anointed one, the one has given us life, he's the one that we're Speaking for. Oh, God could zap them. He could do that very carefully, very easily. But we are his children. If someone was saying something bad about our parents, we'd go at them pretty heavily, wouldn't we? We sure would. What about our Father in heaven? It's time for us to stand up against stuff like that. And start speaking out. 
that we ourselves love our Messiah. When we sit home quietly and silently, the world rapidly runs over us. Why should we cower when we got the powerful, most powerful God in the world standing behind us? If he stands behind us, who's going to go against us? Oh, they might say things, do this and that, but you know what? We got a God that can control. We got a God that spoke in the heavens and the king, all the stars. We got a God that spoke and the light of the sun came. We got a God that speaks and rises up the dead. Now, let them show you their power, right? So my challenge is let's take these great moments that God gives us and comes our way this great opportunity to share Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your message and thank you for guiding us. Heavenly Father, we pray as we accept these challenges and, and follow your ways, Father, that your spirit will be behind us. You will be there with us and guide us. Let us start seeing a new light in you, Father. Let us have those great opportunities to spread the message to others. Give us those opportunities, Father, and open our eyes and hearts that we see those opportunities. Forgive us, Father, of our sins as we leave here today. Your spirit be with us. In Jesus' name, amen.